Welcome to the Institute for Global Engagement's Faith and International Affairs Conference Call Series. My name is John Gallagher, President and CEO at IGE, and I will serve as the moderator on today's call. Thank you to everyone for calling in. I hope that you will enjoy and engage in today's discussion. Today's call is titled, After ISIS, Toward Justice and Conciliation, an increasingly urgent question facing the Middle East and the international community is, what happens the day after ISIS is militarily defeated? How can we prevent groups motivated by the same worldview from rising under a new name to again destabilize the region and beyond? What are the factors that might make for enduring stability, recovery, and transformation when ISIS is driven from Syria, Iraq, and Iraqi Kurdistan? Our distinguished speaker for today's call is Dr. Eric Patterson. Dean of the Robertson School of Government at Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and a research fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. He has extensive experience on issues at the intersection of religion and security, and is the author or editor of numerous books in this field, including Ending Wars Well, Yale 2012, Ethics Beyond War's End, Georgetown 2012, and the Ashgate Research Companion on Military Ethics, 2015. I was also privileged to partner with Eric on an edited volume titled Debating the War of Ideas, Paul Greg McMillan, 2009, with content that seems quite prescient and perhaps even more relevant to today's increasing, increasingly globalized threat than it was in 2009. Eric was also a Rotary Scholar, a 2007 White House Fellow, and has previously served at the State Department and at the Office of Personnel Management. He therefore brings his rich policy experience to the discussion as well. Before we start our conversation, I'd like to provide a brief description of today's call format. We'll begin with approximately 20 minutes of prepared remarks from Dr. Patterson, followed by up to 40 minutes of questions from the audience. For the duration of the call, all participant lines will be placed on mute. If at any point during the call you have a question for Dr. Patterson, please press 5 star and you'll be placed in the queue. As a reminder, this call is on the record and an audio recording will be made available on our IGE website 24 hours after the call. And so now, without further delay, let's get started. Eric, thanks again for joining us, and the floor is yours. John, thank you very much, and my thanks to the Institute for Global Engagement, not only for this conference call today, but for this valuable series. Well, I've had the opportunity to travel to the region several times over the years as an Air Force Reserve officer, as a scholar, and during my time at the State Department. During those times, my focus has been on the scholarly side on countries that have endured persistent warfare. How, how can a society move beyond that? You see, we Americans tend to think about war linear, linearly. There's a beginning, there's a war, and it ends. Our Revolutionary War started it went for seven years, it ended with a treaty. So did the Civil War, so did the War of 1812, so did most of our major conflicts during World War II. We celebrate VJ Day, the victory over Japan, and VE Day, the victory in Europe. But wars that most people face in other parts of the world are not this nature, two, three years, and then over. They're persistent. And it is graven into the hearts and minds of people what it's like to be in conflict all the time. Think about Rwanda. The genocide was in 94, but just 18 months before that, there had been a peace deal brokered by the UN. And four years before that, there had been the termination of another conflict. When did, when did that war actually start? When did it end? If you were a young man in Afghanistan today, neither you nor your parents nor your grandparents for much of their life would have known a country at peace. This was brought to my mind very vividly several years ago in Erbil when I was there for an educational conference. And I was there with some other college faculty from different American universities. And one night we went out for dinner, if you can believe it, to a British pub. And we went out to dinner, and my American colleagues asked our kind of guide, host, interpreter, a very, very sharp young man in his mid-20s, why is it that you people, I can't believe they said it this way, but they said, why is it that you people can't just get along? Can't you let the past be the past? And this young Kurdish man who had traveled all around the world and spoke multiple languages and he was so polished told us the story about when he was seven years old and how his town in the Kurdish region, how his father come rushing home one day 
told them, go out the back door and flee to the mountains. And how the helicopters had risen above his town, shooting at the people. How he and his little sister had been separated from their parents for three days in this rush to hide from the army of Saddam Hussein. He recounted relative after relative lost to murder, to rape. They knew people who'd been gas victims in the family. And then he looked at my American compatriots and he said, I think actually I could probably move beyond this, but I hardly know anyone who can. We are never going to get past this until generations have died and moved on. And that gripping tale about the way conflict impresses itself into a community and into an individual is the reality, I think, that we face when we think about what post-conflict might look like in this area. Let me remind you that a U.N. report that came out in January indicted ISIS for at least 3,500 slaves for the death of at least 18,800 civilians for the displacement of at least 3.2 million people in Iraq and Syria. And, of course, this conflict is unlike others. Not only is it driven by a religious ideology of violent Islamism, but it, is, it crosses traditional national borders, and it involves people of multiple ethnic and religious groups. It is a mess. The UN report said, that as acts of policy, ISIS leaders and their foot soldiers have engaged in, quote, shooting, beheading, torture, burning alive, and of course you know, the report goes on and on and on. I think that one thing that's telling is a Coptic bishop said this in a news report. I'm going to read this somewhat complicated quote slowly, because what he's telling us is that these issues are so dramatic that people are desensitized to them. Here's the quote. The cloth of genocide is not laying overnight. This has happened over decades. And what we've seen is an ongoing persecution that has led to a desensitization, that over time has led to a systematic acceptance of the diminished state as the status quo. And because this was the status quo, all the limits have been pushed, and we are where we are today. In other words, if you are Kurd, if you are Yazidi, if you are Assyrian, if you are Chaldean, if you are a minority group on the other side of the border in Syria, the the level of violence has been going on for so long that we've become desensitized to it, and people were desensitized on the ground. Now, I raise these points to simply say, but there's not some sort of easy, quick fix. I don't think there's an Appomattox moment in this situation where everyone just peaceably goes home. And I don't think that uh, kind of hopeful kumbaya attempts at reconciliation are possible. I think we have to think very pragmatically and prudentially about the kind of place that we want to help people to live in and what are the actual real-world policies and assistance that can be provided both on the ground and from the outside. So saying that, when John read the introduction today, he he talked about a military defeat of ISIS. And let me just briefly say that I concur that I can't imagine this area moving on without without crushing the leadership of ISIS. Uh, I'm open to dialogue on this, but I think that this is a situation where that has to happen for order to be established, and then we can start taking steps towards justice. I'd like for you to visualize for a moment a triangle or a pyramid. My, my talk really rests rest on a concept from my books about what does a just war ethic of post-conflict look like. And I'd say that there's three elements. If you think about a pyramid, the bottom third, the base of the foundation is being order. Every war that ends well ends with has to have order. And then in that middle third of the pyramid is justice. And we have to have a foundation of order. And then in some wars, we can approximate justice. And we'll talk about that in a moment. 
And then think about that, that top part of the pyramid, that small triangle at the top. It has an eyeball in it on the back of the U.S. dollar bill. That is conciliation. And over time, in some wars, we can move towards conciliation. And I'd like to walk you through these three steps and what this means in this region, kind of theoretically and then practically. First, this order has to be established. And order really has three dimensions. One is domestic security. In other words, a, some sort of government ruling over an area, providing law enforcement and military enforcement there. And as you know, right now this is a big question mark. Iraq doesn't control the areas controlled by ISIS. The Kurdish government doesn't control them. Syria doesn't control them. And we're going to have to think about what it looks like in terms of uh, we're going to have to have a meeting of parties to buttress what a government structure is going to look like in the future. And second, and related to that, is governance. Basic institutions, a judiciary, law enforcement, mechanisms for laws and adjudication of disputes, the adjudication of property rights, that's a part of order. I'm not talking about free K-12 education. I'm not talking about lending libraries. I'm not talking about symphonies and art and museums, although those things are all nice, but a minimum level of order. And then third, as a part of an order, is that government has to be safe from external enemies. It has to have some sort of border guarantees, guarantees of not slipping very quickly back into conflict. In some of these areas, the international community can provide a lot of help. Well, let's talk about justice for just a moment. By justice, I mean a very, I have a limited concept of justice as justice is getting what one deserves. Justice is getting one's just deserves. And when we think about the depredations of ISIS in this area and realize there's probably grief to go around and, and guilt to go around in a lot of areas when we think about the Assad regime and other things, there's really two elements to a post-conflict justice. One is, are there ways to hold aggressors accountable? And second, what do we do for victims? When it comes to that first one, one model at the end of World War II is, is that we held a, a leadership elite accountable, just the leadership elite. About 2,000 people went through trials that we associate with Nuremberg and post-Nuremberg trials. But then there was a large group who were reintegrated into society. And certainly there's a lot of low-level ISIS troops that over time may have to pay some sort of light penalty, and we're going to have to figure out ways to integrate them back into communities very, very quickly. But holding the leadership accountable is important. By the way, I think this is going to be difficult, and here's why. The international military tribunals, such as the, the two under UN auspices for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and courts under the ICC don't allow the death penalty. I think that the people on the ground are going to want the death penalty to be a possibility for senior leaders of ISIS if they're captured. Iraq held, uh, used international law and its own penal code in punishing Saddam Hussein and his henchmen, uh, well, a decade ago. That may be what happens in this instance because it's unclear to me how useful some of these international tribunals are. I know, I know, I just stirred a hornet's nest, but let me just say this. The international tribunal for, the, for Rwanda only finished in December of 2015. It only brought uh, criminal charges against about four dozen people in work that spanned a decade and a half at a cost of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. It had a staff of over 250 people for much of its time. And one wonders if that lumbering bureaucratic colossus is really appropriate or if a swifter type of justice makes more sense. As an aside, think about what happened in Sri Lanka several years ago when the governor of Sri Lanka was able to finally crush the Tamil Tigers. That provided an opportunity for a post-war order and for justice and steps towards conciliation. I'm sad to say that 
that government actually didn't take those steps after wiping out its long-term battlefield and terroristic enemy. And I think that that's a lesson for us, that the next steps of justice and conciliation really, really matter when there's a complete battlefield victory. What about the victims? What should be done for the victims? This is an area where not only the international community, but in particular faith-based organizations, nonprofits, NGOs, international non-governmental organizations can really step in to provide assistance. 3.2 million displaced people, the refugee crisis, et cetera, this is going to take a commitment of some period of time to help people no longer see themselves as victims but have an opportunity to start towards a, uh, a future life there. And I, I would be happy to talk more about this. I will say this, though. I think that those of us who are outside of the region need to have some humility about prognosticating about what's best for people, particularly the minority groups on the ground in the region. A question that I've been asking myself and others is this. If I was, the grand, if I was a grandfather living on the Nineveh Plain, what would I tell my grandchildren? What advice would I give them? Would I say, let's hope that the next regime provides us with our liberties Let's stay here. Or would I tell them, go to America, go to Canada, go to the European Union, go to South America? I think that's a question that all of us who care about that region have to ask ourselves when we're thinking about prognosticating about what those people should be doing. Well, let's talk for a moment uh, about conciliation. And I use the term conciliation to mean coming to terms with the past so that belligerents can at least imagine a future where the other side exists. This is not reconciliation. There's no RE because, let's face it, so often there isn't a shared past, at least not one that's hopeful. If you were a 16-year-old in Iraq or a 16-year-old in Afghanistan, you and your parents and your grandparents, have not known anything but war, ups and downs of conflict. So it's hard to imagine that there's some sort of reconciliation possible, but I do think conciliation is possible. Nigel Bigger, the famous theologian and political thinker in the United Kingdom, says, although we can imagine forgiveness, particularly as Christians and people of faith, as an interpersonal dynamic, it is at best an attenuated analog of coexistence when we're talking about political life. Gene Elstein called it knowing forgetting, coming terms to the past so that your future isn't one where you see yourself only as a victim and only see the other as enemy. Coming to terms with the past, what might that look like in this area? It's very difficult to imagine in some ways because there hasn't been order for so long. And order and some moderate steps at justice, justice through recording what happened on the ground, some truth-telling, justice through punishment of some leadership, those are the kinds of things that can provide some first steps towards conciliation, meeting the needs of people on the ground. And then over time, perhaps, individuals and their communities being able to be partners towards some sort of shared future in the region. I think that I've probably said enough at this point to open it up for questions with one last point. Conciliation usually takes a long period of time. It usually is based on new mutual interests. This is how countries that duked it out during World War II, became allies. More than anything else, they feared the Soviet colossus. Think about Israel and Egypt. What was the real basis for the cold peace that has endured there for, for more than 30 years? It's a, it's a re-envisioning of a mutuality of interests. It's not kumbaya. It's not lovey-dovey. But slowly over time, these countries were able to have a certain level of conciliation because of changes to the international order. And 
it is my hope and prayer that we'll see similar steps happen in a post-ISIS environment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patterson, for these insightful uh, comments and analysis. Um, I will ask the first question, uh, and then we'll open up the lines for questions from the audience. Just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, press 5 star. When it's your turn to ask a question, our call administrator, Megan Carter, will announce your name and unmute your line so that you may ask it. Um, lines may be placed on mute following the asking of the question. Um, if your question has been asked by someone else or you just no longer wish to stay in the queue, just press 5 star again and your name will be erased from the queue. Uh, and finally, um, ask that when you're, we ask that when you're called upon, um, please immediately ask your question um, with, with minimal commentary for context, um, but please um, uh, keep your questions concise so that we can um, get to everybody. So um, Eric, again, thanks. One quick a uh, reinforcing comment uh, that I heard in Afghanistan, just because you spoke to it almost exactly. We were working with um, the a Afghan government on the reintegration program, all the different fighters at the lower levels that said they wanted to come back to their communities. And I was actually meeting with an advisor to Karzai who looked at me discussing this program that we said had to be run by the Afghan ministers and was a sovereign Afghan program on a very sensitive issue, and he said, when is the coalition going to take public responsibility for the reintegration program? And I thought it was a setup question, and I, and I said, well, we certainly would want to insert, insert ourselves between the Afghan government and its people. This is your future, your sovereignty, and we'll enable you as best we can um, uh, from the sidelines. And he asked me exactly what you just said. He said, how, long, how old are the ministers that you think would lead this program? I said, between 40 and 50. And he said, how long have we been at war? And he said, and I said, 30 years. And he said, then you are asking people who have known nothing but war for their entire adult lives to credibly lead a peace initiative that would bring fighters back into their communities. He said, the people won't follow, and if we don't find a way to develop this partnership more publicly, um, the program won't work. Anyway, I just wanted to tell that quick story because it speaks um, precisely um, to what you said. My question for you, Eric, is in Iraq, um, when during the surge period, uh, you'll remember that we worked really hard to kind of keep some sectarian separation so that the, quote, ethno-sectarian violence, uh, stopped or the ethno-sectarian violence was um, severely diminished. And we very quickly found what we jokingly called ethno-sectarian bureaucracy emerge in its place, meaning ministers who had control over where clean water was distributed would sort of stoke those old rivalries by simply directing the water and the, and the bureaucratic resources to their own um, sectarian counterparts. And so efforts on the ground to, to limit the fighting were only, you know, countered, I guess, in the way that governance happened. Can you talk a little bit to that and whether or not there is a faith dimension and forgiveness and sort of this um, uh, hard-to-measure element that's going to have to take root for bureaucracies and people on the ground to not just continue the conflict? Um, do you see it this way? And do, you have any, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think that there's – thank you for telling that Afghanistan story. I think it's very powerful, and it aligns with many things I've heard and experienced over the years in other places as well. Let me say something first about – let me say something second about forgiveness and first about states and boundaries and bureaucracies. So on the first point, the assumption of the – when we talk about those ethnocentric bureaucracies, leaders, et cetera. When the U.S. looks at these places, unfortunately, we've, we've just settled for a status quo in terms of what the borders are and what the government structure should look like. I was never satisfied in the early 2000s. By the way, I, I supported the war in 2003. I still think it was the right thing to do based on what we knew at the time. And, however, I wasn't convinced then that there needs to be a unified Iraq. I would prefer for the United States to openly support an independent Kurdish republic. I think it's, it can be large enough to be stable. 
And I think that at this stage, the kind of violence that we've seen over the past 15 years is that there's a, a good case to be made for there to be a, what I call a rough Sunni state to the West and allow the Shias to have their own state that is a large part of what used to be Iraq. I, I bring that up not to argue it here, but to say we kind of fell into, okay, it has to be a unified Iraq, it has to have this kind of bureaucracy, it has to have this kind of ministry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if we start from that premise, we then we have to go down that, those paths. And I dare say that um, if the, in the realities of today, if the Shias dealt with the Shias and if the and if there was a kind of a Sunni designated area and a Kurdish designated area, uh, that may be the path towards a more stable regional security. Now when it comes to forgiveness, I think that this is an important point. Uh, one thing that, that people of faith, individuals in particular, can bring to this are efforts, goodwill gestures across these sectarian lines. It can be people, uh, for instance, people who are clerics, people of an official religious capacity, that can step across political boundaries to take efforts towards some sort of conciliation. Someone like a grand Ayatollah, uh, Ali Sistani, for instance, has played that role numerous times in specific instances. Uh, that's, a, that's an important thing. However, it's very difficult for politics politicians to go down a path of overt forgiveness or asking for forgiveness for something even in the deep past. What is more likely for, uh, particularly in a democratic country, that, that's very, very difficult. I mean, you'll be thrown out of office in the next election. But action, there can be conciliatory acts that take place. Think about the Israel-Egypt situation a generation ago. No one expected Sadat to say on national TV, I will go to the ends of the earth to make peace. And a week later, when interviewed by Walter Cronkite, he said, I will even go to Israel to make peace. This was a hawk. This was a guy who had consistently denigrated Israel. He'd fought against Israel. But he then took steps, and those steps, by the way, were reciprocated by another hawk, Menachem Begin, they were, there were opportunities for conciliatory steps. They didn't give any ground. They didn't say they didn't have interests for their people. Uh, Sadat indicted Israel when he spoke before the Knesset, but he also said, I, as the leader of the Egyptian people, it is time for the blood to stop flowing of young men, including young men on the other side of the border. And I think that th that's, that's the kind of conciliatory step that can be taken, but it's, it's much different than say, asking for forgiveness for bad things that happened in the past. Thank you so much, Eric, for that. Um, let's now open it up to the audience for further questions. Uh, go ahead, Megan. Yes, thank you. Um, our first question comes from Carlene Fisher, who's a Regent University student. Ms. Fisher, you may go ahead with your question. Hi, Dr. Patterson. Thank you for your um, insight and all the information you've given us. Um, I was born and raised in Iran as a Christian minority, as an Assyrian. And so um, I have seen the secular aspect of Islam, and I also have seen the religious part of it because I came after the revolution in 1979. And so my question is really, I think, the root of all the issues that are going on in the Middle East is Islam. And I wanted to see how you see that because since Islam is about fighting um, and we have a value for peace and reconciliation, it seems like they are um, in really in opposition to each other as far as goals in life. So I wanted to see how you see that because the um, example you gave about Egypt and Israel, um, he was not a religious leader and he was probably most likely more of a secular man. But the nations that embrace Islam as their governing um, rulership, 
uh, they have a different goal than uh, someone who's more secular. And so that, I think, is a big problem that there's really not a goal of wanting to reconcile because their goal is always to expand Islam. So I wanted to see, to hear your view on that. Colleen, thanks for asking that. It is certainly true that since 1979, which in many ways is a symbolic year, that this region has just seemed to be aflame with Muslims killing other Muslims. I think that sometimes is just forgotten. The number one, the largest group of people killed by Islamic State or by any of these violent Islamist groups are typically their fellow Muslims. Right? In, mm-hmm. the, in, in about a 12-month period, you have the victory of the Islamists in Tehran, which motivated people around the world, including many Sunnis like Osama bin Laden, were fascinated by the Islamic Revolution. You also have within that 12-month period, that next year, the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviets, and that war which has had global ramifications, that this creation of these global Afghan Arabs, we call them, and the, the seeding of this violent Islamic, uh, Islamist um, viewpoint, And third, of course, in Saudi Arabia, the assault on the mosque in Mecca during the Hajj by violent Islamists, something I think no one would have ever expected. It just boggles the mind. And certainly there's been a a war, what John and I wrote about in Debating the War of Ideas, there's been a war with actually multiple wars going on within the greater Muslim world. Now, that being said, the... Uh, if religion is, if, if elements, if religious justifications for violence are part of what's going on in the region, then religious justifications for citizenship, for the state, for governance, for peace are going to have to be, because they're a, a part of the solution, they're interwoven into the life that people live in that part of the world. And certainly there are religious leaders and religious people on the ground who'd like to see their kids grow up without gunfire, that would like to see their countries successful and stable and enduring. It isn't necessarily the case that it has to be this constant conflict, Sunni versus Shia, and then this kind of outbidding by radical Sunni Islamists that we've seen over the past decade. But I think that the political reality on the ground is 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 that the war is going to have to be waged against ISIS to beat them on the battlefield. And that won't exterminate this violent ideology over the longer period of time. However, it will be an important milestone in defeating people who will kill based on this reading of Islam. And that's 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 an important first step. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Julie Bodner. Julie, you can go ahead with your question, please. Julie, where are you? Julie? Julie? Hello? Okay. Um, well, I think we'll move on to to our next uh, uh, caller. Our next uh, question comes from Kenneth Gilbride, who is also with uh, Regent University. Uh, go ahead, Kenneth, with your question. Oh yes, thank you. Um, uh, mine's a two-part question, real quick, and I'm hoping I'm on the right track here. Um, Do you feel that America is falling out of God's grace? And if so, should we have a more united worldview when getting involved in other countries and conflict? Tara, thank you for that question. I I think I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction, and that is this. When we're facing a challenge like being supportive of people who have been oppressed by ISIS, and when we're facing a challenge kind of the – the grotesque number of refugees, of rape victims and the like across this region, uh, it is important to recognize that we have to approach it with a level of humility. 
that we don't necessarily understand, and by us I mean the United States government. The United States government needs to approach these things with a certain level of humility that A, can't solve every problem, and B, it doesn't have the answer to every situation. Now that being said, there are a couple of guiding principles that can inform our policy. One of them can be for us not to take a postmodern stance that kind of says, uh, anything goes, who are we to say? Throughout history, there's always been war crimes. But to, but to be decisive and say, in this instance, it's very clear that what ISIS has done is immoral and it's illegal, and we want to support international and local efforts to hold them accountable. That's important. Uh, a second thing is that the U.S. should engage in policies that uh, maximize the opportunity for churches, synagogues, mosques, nonprofit groups, for citizens to help. Let me give an example. Uh, it's, it's become better known in the past month or two that Canada has a law that's different than the United States that not only allows but really encourages civilian groups in society to host refugees, to bring them to Canada and to sponsor them and to take care of them, to, to provide for their needs. And, uh, and I'm talking about, for instance, families, families who've been displaced in, in Syria or Iraq coming to Canada at the expense of a local church or a local nonprofit group and, then, and being taken care of. Uh, we have a different... Uh, legal situation in the United States that impedes that type of thing. And a smart set of policies that's consistent with a love-your-neighbor worldview would be to allow those types of policies to move forward, to maximize the impact that NGOs, faith-based groups, corporations, and the like, people of goodwill can make on behalf of people on the ground there. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Eric. Our next question comes from Mona Malik from the Assyrian Aid Society of America. Go ahead, Mona, with your question. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Patterson. Um, my question um, is in regards <coughs> to the, the comment you made about what's the best uh, for minorities, and you um, had the example of what would a grandfather in the Nineveh plain tell his grandchild, and you had two options there. One was the hope that the next regime gives us our human rights, again, dependent on uh, what others will do for us, and then, or, or would he tell his grand, their grandchildren to emigrate to, you know, other countries, so maybe you could find that um, freedom of uh, religion and and um, and human rights. But I think if uh, we, as people from outside the region, listen to uh, the indigenous Assyrians there. Of what they're actually wanting. What's taking root right now is uh, the encouragement to fight to, uh, for recognition to determine our own future, um, especially what has happened recently, um, it, this is exactly two years ago today that, that ISIS invaded Mosul, and we were abandoned by both the central government and the Peshmerga. So the, the uh, Assyrians and the Yazidis have no trust in either of the regimes. At, at the same time, they have every right and they have the will to stay and fight for their own land. So my question is, is why isn't the U.S. administration and a lot of the think tanks in the U.S., why are they ignoring that dimension and that will and that hope and that need that the minorities have to stay in their own land that they've been in uh, as indigenous people, especially the Assyrians, as for the last 6,000 years and as Christians for the last 2,000 years. Thank you. Mara, you have asked a, uh, you, you've made a powerful argument, and I think it's an important one. I do, I, I, w I, I can't speak on behalf of the United States government, uh, but what I, what I can say is I think that there is a question mark about who will be responsible for the security of very small minority groups? And you're, you're exactly right, and I'm glad that you raised this question, that there's a tremendous amount of suspicion 
well-justified suspicion, such as due to what happened at Mosul, by the minorities towards either uh, to any of the regimes in the area. And I'm speaking about uh, Erbil, Baghdad, Damascus, etc. cetera. From, a, from an international perspective, at what point, and this is a rhetorical question, but, it, but it's, it's important, at the international level, how small should a group be before there's a massive expenditure on its behalf to help it set up its own essentially state or its own protected area within a federal system. And I looked at Kosovo with a co-author, Roger Mason, a few years ago. After the 1999 intervention, what was the cost to the massive troop deployment in Kosovo? I think people don't really realize that after the 1999 intervention in Kosovo, to, to save a people group of 1.2 million people, we put approximately 25,000 troops on the ground to start, and that grew and then diminished over time. But, it, but for about a seven-year period, that was the number of troops. That was the same number of troops that we put on the ground in Afghanistan for a population of well over 20 million after 9-11. The, in, in other words, and the cost was in the, in the hundreds of millions every year to the U.S. and its allies to administer this little tiny place. I mean, I grew up in Southern California. A country of 1.2 million people is incomprehensible to me as someone who used to live on the outskirts of Los Angeles. And the, I think that the, the pragmatic question here is, does the international community do, do, for instance, its sons and daughters and its national militaries that were called to, pr to protect their own countries, do they owe some, or what is the obligation to pay hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to protect uh, a tiny, tiny quasi-state? I'm not saying that there is one or that there isn't one, but that's a... I think that's one of those very, very difficult behind-the-scenes types of questions that policymakers are going to have to address in situations like this. I think the best leverage is for state parties to be, to be putting the pressure on the regional governments. That's, that's where probably the most realistic long-term leverage is going to be. Thanks for, thanks for bringing up this, I think, a, a extremely difficult situation. Okay. Um, our next caller, caller, uh, I'm afraid I don't have your name, but when I unmute your line, if you could give your name and your affiliation, please. Let me go ahead with your question. I don't know if you're referring to me. I'm the Sam Ilhan. Yes. From Syria. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I am here uh, visiting in the U.S. lobbying for the Syriac, Syrian people of Syria, and I heard the last part of the of Dr. Eric's talk, and I appreciate very much what he shared. Very helpful. My question is is, is kind of a specific situation that we have now in northeast Syria and the city of Qamishli, where ISIS uh, has has uh, you know, uh, design, uh, designated, you know, suicide bombers and caused the killing of uh, uh, over 20 uh, Syriac, uh, Syrian people so far. These are civilians who are like in a store or in a restaurant and ISIS walks in, you know. Or like the most recent attack, the Syriac Orthodox Patriarch was in town doing a mass in uh, uh, and ISIS were trying to get in, the Syriac police stopped him, and two Syriac police died as a result. Uh, now, we have in the northeast of Syria, in Qamishli, we have something called, the, uh, 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 we have like a local rule, democratic self-administration, it's called. And it's basically Kurds, Arabs, and Syriacs from the region who are, taking uh, charge of the 
security situation in the absence of the government. Now, how do you deal with this situation where we, you have secured the region and the borders from ISIS? They are now on the defense before we were at the defense in these areas, but still they are able to penetrate and to target for the last few months specifically the Syriac Assyrian community, uh, which is, you know, causing uh, a continuation of the immigration of this uh, group, which we have been trying to, to, to stop unsuccessfully because of the instability. How could we deal with a situation like this, you know, where, as I said, you have mentioned the need to establish security, secure border, have a justice system. We do have all of that established, but still the uh, terrorism is attacking. How can we put a stop to these terrorist attacks? You've asked one of those questions that's almost an imponderable. Let me first applaud the efforts by locals to impose security. I think that this is very, very important. And we do have these pockets of stability in places around the world where uh, citizens establish a militia or they establish some sort of self-defense force because there isn't uh, a, a national government authority that's providing that level of security to them. This is one of the differences, for instance, between Somalia and Somali land in the north. Um, so th those types of efforts that your fellow citizens have done are deeply, deeply important. People who are willing to take responsibility uh, for their own security and to protect uh, their fellow citizens, that's very, very, very important. That was a key to success to what we call the Anbar Awakening several years ago in Iraq, locals turning on the really what was pre-ISIS, what was AQI at the time. So that's important. No one's going to know the ground better than local citizens. That's not going to stop every suicide bomber, and I frankly don't have a pat answer about how you stop uh, those types of individual terrorists who glory in their individual sacrifice, whether it's a mass shooter or a suicide attacker in Europe or in the United States, or if it's on the ground there, it's, it's almost impossible to stop some of these individuals. And I don't believe that we can drain the swamps of ideology, to quote one of America's national leaders, through jobs programs alone. In other words, I don't think that there's an economic thing that's going to solve the problems of this violent Islamism and, and individual terrorists. But what I do think is that establishing local security is a first step to that, and communities working uh, very, very hard to train their young people on the right path rather than on a path that leads to ISIS. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question comes from uh, Dennis Hoover with IGE. Uh, Dennis, you can go ahead with your question. Thanks, Megan, and thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, I wanted to follow up a little bit more on the uh, – you'd raised uh, important points about the costs involved in even uh, protecting a small area. Um, one idea that's been – pushed uh, lately is uh, drawing an analogy to the Marshall Plan and that we need something like that for the region um, for uh, realistic prospects for long-term stability. Um, and uh, so that's a whole other scale entirely of, uh, of resources that would have to be um, put together. But uh, so I was just wondering if you had further thoughts on, on that as a as a model that uh, that the international community should should seriously be using in this situation. Yeah, Dennis, it's a it's a pleasure to hear from you, and thanks for supporting this event today. Um, sure. In my opinion, the answer to that question is no, and I, and let me explain why, and then let me 
uh, offer an, an alternative approach, which is the CPA in Sudan. So the, when we talk about a massive influx of resources from outside of the region, uh, I think that the big question is what is that going to solve? And what the Marshall Plan did was a, a major rebuilding of Europe in part to, to establish those countries as, uh, as allies against the Soviet Union and global communism. And uh, it was in America's interest as well as in its uh, commensurate with its ideals, its ideals to, to, uh, in terms of being a part of Western civilization and that these societies could be friends once again. Uh, but, the, but a question anytime we start talking about massive, massive financial flows is do, do we really believe that people, for instance, in Europe and in the West and Canada and perhaps Japan and perhaps wealthier parts of Latin America, the Chinese, that they have some sort of obligation to send billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars to this war-torn region and, and uh, through their government channels. I'm not talking about nonprofit or faith-based channels. And, and frankly, I'm not convinced that those countries owe something, uh, some sort of Marshall Plan level of reconstruction aid to the greater Middle East. Now, that being said, that doesn't uh, say that there shouldn't be some investment, but what the, I think what the West can do best is provide assistance towards security and expertise and know-how and some preliminary steps. But the folks on the ground are going to have to rebuild their societies themselves. They've got to be authentic. Uh, that's the way it's going to work. Now, a, a slightly different model, one that we haven't talked about, but which resulted in not only the end of, of almost 60 years of war between what was ostensibly uh, North and South Sudan, but ultimately engineered the independence of South Sudan, uh, a piece that has been marred certainly over the past five years, but is the CPA. The, um, that peace treaty, which is a, uh, a great mark of American successful diplomacy, took, was, is really seven individual documents that built trust between the parties over a period of more than three years. So it's not just a single piece of paper, but it's a set of arrangements and agreements about things like oil and about voting rights and about potential future sovereignty for South Sudan and things, uh, where the U.S. played a, uh, an important role. Other international countries uh, in the U.N. Uh, and Italy in particular played a role. In other words, it was bringing uh, belligerents to the table through a series of meetings and a series of smaller agreements that over time led to uh, a, a, a real security arrangement. Now, that being said, I don't think you do that. I, I don't think that's possible to do with ISIS, but I do think that type of arrangement, uh, small agreements between Baghdad, Damascus, other regional partners like Riyadh, for instance, and, and Amman, and Erbil is, is probably the most likely steps towards a more enduring peace after beating ISIS on the battlefield. And, and the steps can be already ongoing. We don't have to wait for ISIS to get these national capitals plus Erbil working on what, is the, what are things going to look like after ISIS. I'm going to do something unusual. Okay, I'm going to throw the ball back to thanks. Dennis, if that's okay. Dennis, you want to push back on that at all, or your thoughts? Oh, um, no, I, I, I take the point, and um, I guess the only pushback that comes to mind, though, is that um, you know, the, these regional powers who you mentioned that, that should be a part of security dialogues and, and agreements at various uh, levels of ambition, I suppose. Um, some of those uh, very regimes do have extensive resources. Um, and mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there's uh, there are ways of uh, approaching the problem that would uh, 
um, uh, not only involve uh, getting security agreements from these regimes, but also resources. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we're actually getting to where we have time for probably one more question, and um, that's going to come from Delia Kashet with the Nineveh Council of America. Uh, Ms. Kashet, please go ahead with your question. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question focuses on um, post-Musul offenses. So Musul, which was mm -hmm. once the home of all of Iraq's ethnic groups, Arabs, Kurds, Turkmen, mm -hmm. Chaldeans, Assyrians, um, as well as a variety of religions and sects, um, the, the big question that I have is, will the liberation of Musul undo the, arrange, undo the arrangement Daesh put in place? Um, how do you convince the victims of Daesh that what happened to them was an anomaly after seeing their neighbors uh, turn against them, loot their homes, and lead Daesh to them? With this broken trust, um, you know, in my opinion, it's insane to risk it again and return to live among the same people. Um, the other consequence of this, of the Daesh occupation, is that what Daesh has done to the souls of Maslawis, which is irreversible in, in some cases. Uh -huh. So since taking control, Daesh has recruited thousands of men and women, turned them into terrorists, desensitized them to the daily acts of barbarism. So what, what in your opinion, should the, uh, should the next U.S. administration do in terms of what to do with these people and these families who've been complicit with Daesh? Well, you have raised uh, one of the reasons that I say that order and limited justice are so, so difficult in the real world. And uh, there is a role to play. You asked about specifically what the U.S. government should do. Let me first say that this is a, this type of intractable situation, what some social scientists and strategists are starting to call a wicked problem set. In other words, multiple intractable things all overlapping. This is, a, this is one of those spaces where we need people who are bigger than politics to set an example and to call for peace and for some sort of conciliation. Government leaders alone can't do it. This is a time where you need Robert E. Lee's, you need Nelson Mandela's, you need Abraham Lincoln's, you need uh, uh, Pope Francis types of people. You need people who are going to say all of this terrible stuff happened. It was real. We're going to record it because we don't want it to happen again and we don't want to forget, but we cannot have our future be all the past. And there, are, uh, there aren't great success stories about programs that have been both men and women who have kind of brought people along in, 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 the, in the thousands or the tens of thousands like what you're talking about. But what, what I will say is this. In addition to social actors, religious leaders, clerics of every denomination, providing some insight about a, a, a path towards peace in one's own heart and some level of conciliation within communities, what can the external world do? You asked about specifically, you know, what can the U.S. government do in a situation like the one that you're specifically talking about? Well, people in Washington aren't going to be able to provide a solution to the facts on the ground in a post Mosul environment. That being said, uh, and, and, it's, and it's hard to believe, frankly, if this president ever uses words like red lines, because he's just been so over the map in his foreign policies, it's hard to know what, what is a red line and what is not. But what we certainly want, wouldn't want to see happen in a post-dash Mosul is the pendulum to swing all the way the other way with a total breakdown of law and order with reprisal killings in the hundreds or in the thousands. And so one of the types of things that international partners could be a, a, attempting to do is to provide real law and order to assist local law enforcement and local militia forces on the ground to protect human life in a, in a post-Dash Mosul. 
I think what Dash has done there, what Islamic State has done in this region is horrifying. It's, it's beyond belief. I would hate to see the pendulum swing the other way. Order needs to be established so that these first steps towards meeting people's basic needs and then their other human needs can follow that. Uh, and it's going to take time. I wish I had a, a better, more hopeful, beautiful answer for that. But establishing order and not letting ISIS burn everything down on its way out, that's critical. Thanks. John, Megan, thank you very, very much for hosting me today. <laughs> Eric, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this has been a privilege. And, um, you know, as, as all um, listeners can tell, um, this is a discussion that it goes on and on um, and must continue to go on because, you know, there is – when problems approach sort of the wicked characterization or when the nonlinear battlefield tends toward kaleidoscopic where well-intended inputs uh, can, are just as likely to produce counterproductive as productive outputs, um, it's really sort of the deep conversations across comfortable boundaries and the leading-edge thinking – like coming from people like Eric Patterson that are going to enable the decision makers, sometimes referred to as the management class um, in D.C., to shift over and start applying uh, this best thinking to the decisions. And we may begin to see then finally, you know, our inputs leading to outputs and outcomes um, a little bit more proportionally than I would argue we've seen in the last 50 years. So, Eric, thank you for doing not only your part, but more than your share of the task, as General McChrystal would say. Um, and we look forward to uh, partnership and dialoguing with you in the future. I would encourage all callers to consult the work that um, Eric's put together from his books and many articles. Um, uh, I hope you'll join us again on our next Faith and International Affairs call on the 28th of July. It will feature Dr. Elizabeth Pedromo, who will be discussing the Pan-Orthodox Council, Why It Matters for Religion and Global Change. Again, thanks, Eric. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, all listeners, uh, and have a great day.